the 400 meters, the single lap, the CEO of lactic acid, if you will. It's an event that brings out the uttermost grit in any type of athlete and routinely enters the conversation as having one of the most difficult learning curves of the track world. It also takes form in the 4x4 of being the electrifying closer to just about every track meet you've ever watched. The notion of running exactly one lap as fast as you can is a tantalizing benchmark athletes can't resist trying out and those who choose to specialize in the event evolve into this rare but incredibly tough breed of strength sprinters. Dozens would make their mark in the record books for the quarter, but some would be so far ahead of their time that it took decades before anyone could contest such legendary marks. This is the world record progression of the 400 meters. To prevent any confusion, the 440 yard was the primary event that took place back in the 19th and some of the 20th century, so marks will be denoted as such and conversions will be made too. While the IAAF progression list documents its first record from 1865, recorded results actually date back to the very early 1800s in British media. In a recap section of an 1834 newspaper, recounts of pedestrian John Ward would show that he ran the quarter in 56 seconds in 1803. And another newspaper references a 56 second time in 1809 by someone with the last name Wood. It wouldn't be until all the way until 1865, until Edward Hunt ran 53.5, but Charles Guy Pym just a few months later would run a monster record of 49.7 on November 11th, 1865, marking the first recorded sub-50 time. What appears interesting is that the IAAF credits him with a time of 50 and a quarter seconds, and that this specific mark was discredited as a record. But it's unsure what particular source disqualifies this mark as such. This time would be eventually surpassed by Richard Buttery, who ran 48 and a quarter second on October 4th, 1873. But this mark was also met with skepticism due to alleged questionable timing methods. This was mainly because another man, H. Reed, had run 48 and a half seconds before this, so they wanted to make sure Buttery could run the record again. As far as any publications go though, no one would beat this mark for the next 20 years, and it would take a new millennium entirely before someone stepped up to Reed and Buttery's abilities. While the IAAF started officially ratifying records in 1912, they did qualify a record from over a decade beforehand that was considered the new best mark, which was 47.8 seconds by Maxi Long on September 29th, 1900. The first 400 meter record though, was officially done by Charles Reed Path from the US, who ran 48.2 at the 1912 Olympics. This era is quite difficult and a bit confusing to keep up with because most countries were beginning to switch to the metric version, but almost every meet in America still held the 440. So both records did teeter between the two, but nevertheless were equally as important in lowering the record down. The 440 record was still trudging forward, as its time converted into 400 meters was still far superior in the end. In 1916, Ted Meredith ran 47.4 at the IC4A Championships, while Eric Liddell from Great Britain lowered the 400 meter one to 47.6 at the 1924 Olympic Games. The 440 had actually stagnated in its place as plenty had tied it, but Bud Spencer from the US would become the first man in a while to triumph over the 440's converted time, clocking in a 47 flat in the 400, at the Pacific AAU Games. For over 30 years, the quarter, both metric and imperial, had appeared to halt in its tracks within the 47 second range. But fortunately, Ben Eastman from the US would run the record of a lifetime at Stanford University, taking an entire second off of the 440 record on March 26, 1932, running 46.4. What's quite phenomenal about this record too, is that the 220 record at the time was 20.6, set by James Carlton from Australia, and Eastman's first 220 of his 440 came in at 21.3. 
Nevertheless, American Bill Carr would set the new 400 meter record at the 1932 Olympic Games, where he ran slightly more conservative splits to take USA's sixth gold for the event. Carr and Eastman's records were equally as jaw-dropping for the amount of time taken off for such a short event, but the 440 would be the one to slow down as the 400 became more popular and competitive as the years went by. It would take another four years for anyone to beat the 400 record, but it would not take place at the Olympic Championships, but rather the NCAA ones, where college athlete Archie Williams ran 46.1 to beat the record by a tenth of a second, and Rudolf Harbig from Germany would bring home the country's first ever record on August 12, 1939, clocking in a nice 46 flat. Grove Klemmer would tie both the 440 and 400 records just within a month of each other, but no one could seem to break through the elusive 46 second barrier. After half a decade, Jamaica would finally see their first bouts of mid-distance supremacy, because Herb McKinley would prove to be one of the strongest quarter runners with back-to-back -back records, one of which converted would be a sub-46. Although, conversions wouldn't need to be made anymore, because the first recorded sub-46 time would occur in the 400 on July 2nd, 1948, where McKinley ran 45.9 at the AAU Championships. Even another Jamaican would get in on the action, as George Roden ran almost identical splits to McKinley's record, except he ran one-tenth of a second faster in the first half, which helped him secure a time of 45.8 on August 22nd, 1950. The 440 was looking to be an obscured event though, because a man by the name of Lou Jones would rewrite history in the 400 meters with these times. is brought to its feet by the blistering pace of the 400 meter run a world's record topples three world's marks are broken at this meet three more were tied in the 400 lou jones of the army clocks a tremendous 45.2 seconds one of the top performances carrying the olympic torch for america this november a truly astounding aggregation of talent will take the field in australia despite a five-year drought Lou Jones brought the record down by over half a second in just a single year. His 45.2 alerted 400 specialists that there was now a new barrier to collectively work towards, and that was to now run the quarter in under 45 seconds. During this time, the 440-yard record had also begun to fall through the likes of Jim Lee and Glenn Davis, but Jones's record seemed nearly impossible to beat. That was, until the 1960 Olympic Games, where one of the most magical heats would occur in Rome, as two athletes would push each other far beyond what they thought they were capable of, and would simultaneously break the record on September 6, 1960. <laughs> In perhaps the closest and emphatic 400 meter Olympic heat in history, Otis Davis from the US and Carl Kaufman from West Germany both ran 44.9 to break the 45 second barrier, but Davis would be handed the win for yet another United States gold in the event. While both men were credited with tying the record of running 44.9 via hand time, which was the standard back then, automatic timing corrections would later reveal that they technically hadn't broken 45, as Davis was credited with a 45.07 and Kaufman with a 45.08. For now though, both athletes shared the record of 44.9, but this actually wouldn't matter for very long as American Adolph Plummer replicated this time in the 440 yard, meaning that his time was the undisputed first sub-45 mark, both with and without conversions. With this, the Imperial record was back on top for the first time in quite a while. Even with the event seeing less and less involvement, the Americans were such a driving force that kept the scene alive to defend their quarter-mile shrine. 
Interestingly enough though, the next record set would have hand-timed marks for both the 400 and 440, as Tommy Smith would just barely better Plummer's mark by running 44.8 on May 20th, 1967. As for the 400 meters, all three timers would confirm 44.5, but for the 440 record, he had just lucked out with two out of the three timers, clocking him in at 44.8. Just the very next year, Vince Matthews had brought the metric event back into the limelight by running 44.4, but this would be the shortest lived record in the event's history, which was surprisingly followed by one of the biggest drops in time too, as Lee Evans ran 44 seconds flat at the US Olympic trials and Larry James was right behind running 44.1. Unfortunately for Evans though, this time was not to be ratified as a world record, because Evans would end up being caught wearing what are called brush spikes, a type of shoe with dozens of little spikes to provide superior grip to the track, thus providing a competitive edge. Matthews' record had also been rescinded since he wore the same spikes, so the record was properly credited to James. Normally this would be a blow to someone's confidence to have their record taken away from them, but Evans would show he didn't need a special type of spike to run fast, as in Mexico City for the 1968 Olympics, he would change the 400 meters forever with this time. The first ever sub-44 time, and the second one would occur too as Larry James was right behind to support Evans with what would be the new greatest 400 meter race in history by far, as the Americans ran blistering fast times and sweeped all three medals with no one else in sight. It was no question at this point that the 400 was the Americans event to hold down. There was simply no one that could contest such immense talent and perseverance. And after this record, there actually wouldn't be anyone at all to rival such a feat. Over the next 10 years, the Sub-44 was slowly starting to become a myth to pull off again. A relic of the past that could never be beaten, even with the toughest up-and-comers around. Alberto Juan Torrena was the fastest mark seen in quite a while at the 1976 Olympic Games, but 44-26 was still a far shot all things considered. Then after this time, no one would even come within half a second of Lee Evans. The 400 meter record would stand tall for more years to come, and by the early 80s, it was just looking to be a lost cause. Thankfully, NCAA athlete Butch Reynolds would come out of absolutely nowhere with the season of a lifetime in 1987, dropping three times under 44.2 and took the bronze at the World Championships. Then the next year, he ran his first ever sub-44 time at the US Olympic Trials, looking to be the successor to Lee Evans everyone had been waiting for for the last two decades. At a meet in Zurich to simply tune up for the Olympics, the 400 meter record would be taken to a level no one thought was possible and would also lower it to a point where no one would be able to take it any further. And now comes Butch Reynolds being pushed by Steve Lewis in blue. Reynolds is up to his shoulder. Reynolds is steam past him. And Butch Reynolds is coming away. All six foot three of him. He brings Steve Lewis with him, the 19 year old. And Danny Everett will be third. And look at that. He's done it. The world record is his at sea level. And he's murdered it. He's taken it apart. And justice has been done at last. The fastest man in the world at altitude or sea level. 43.30, and that obliterates Lee Evans from the record book. And the world record now confirmed at 43.29, even faster than we thought. Everett second, 44.20, and in third place, Steve Lewis. America. Running a personal best of 0.64 seconds, Butch Reynolds ran what was essentially the perfect 400. 
21.4 for the first half and still having the strength to run 21.89 in the back half for an incomprehensible time of 43.29. There were simply no words that can truly encompass such a mark. The record had stood for almost 20 years, and now it's been broken into pieces where no one could basically touch it anymore. This was what many people would consider the end game of the quarter, and even though Reynolds had plenty more years in the tank, his momentum would be interrupted rather quickly, as a two-year suspension for alleged drug use would put a harsh halt to his phenomenal career thus far. Even after appealing his case and being allowed to run at the US Olympic Trials, the IAAF threatened to suspend any athlete that would compete against him, but they would eventually let Reynolds run. After placing fifth in the Open Four and being offered a spot on the 4x4 squad as an alternate, the IAAF would ban Reynolds from competing at the Olympics anyways, and Reynolds would later win a libel suit against the IAAF. Upon returning to competition, Reynolds would run solid times, but the 4329 was an inexplicably legendary threshold that maybe no one was meant to ever touch again. Except, during the 90s, a legend would slowly start to formulate the perfect sprinting career, as he became so utterly dominant that he would go down in history as not just one of the best 400 meter runners, but one of the best athletes in general to ever live. This man's name was Michael Johnson. Michael Johnson arrived onto the public scene in the late 80s, as a solid sprinter who mainly found his groove in the 200 when competing under the NCAA. Following his departure from the collegiate scene and running with professionals now, his progress had exploded where he ran back-to-back -back undefeated seasons in the 200 with a world title and also ran a few 400s around the 44-2 range. While he mainly used his 400 as an accessory towards his two, his last 400 in 1992 displayed a very promising future in the event, quickly joining the elite club of sub-44 runners, running 4398. This single race likely led to Johnson's new brand as a 200-400 runner as opposed to a 200 specialist. However, he would soon pivot to hyper-focus on the 4 as he would break 44 again, running 4374, and went on to win the 1993 World Championships, running 4365. This time would mean almost nothing though, when he took the baton as the anchor in the 4x4, because this leg would be the single best display of the 400 ever seen to this very day. It wasn't tough at all, you know. I didn't want to let these guys down. I knew they had all run tremendous legs before me, so I didn't want to let them down. And uh, it just feels good, you know. I get to compete against these guys. It feels good to be able to compete with them for once. And uh, you see what happens when we compete together. All right, congratulations. 42-91, a split that was rich with raw adrenaline, speed, and a level of tenacity never seen before. And the 4x4 record was unsurprisingly shattered as a result. It was clear at this point that Johnson would commit to the 400, but strangely enough, the next year would hint otherwise. In 1994, Johnson had returned back to the 200, where his times were a bit average in comparison, but in all fairness, it was a year without a major championship race. In 1995, everyone would finally get their answer regarding which event he would officially commit to, and both sides would be equally as satisfied as Johnson won both the two and the four at USA Championships and opted to run both of them at the World Championships held in Gothenburg. The 400 would be the first one of two events for him to run, and with 100 to go, Johnson looked to be taking Reynolds' near impossible record for good. We're on for something here. 
look at him go. Watch for the world record. Johnson streeting away from Reynolds. Will he get it? It's close. He's just missed it. By a team. He's in a class of his own. Even that last 50 metres, he went out so hard. And his bend, his top bend between 200 and 300 metres is always so amazing. Being a tenth of a second off, Michael Johnson would just barely miss the world record, but would run the second fastest 400 meters in history with a time of 43.29. Even though he wasn't the fastest man in history over the distance at this point, the fact that he occupied half of the greatest times on the all-time list proved the record was more than doable at this point, but he was just going to need the perfect day for it. Perhaps at the 1996 Olympic Games? Sadly, no, but he would still run 43-49, and even went on to run a jaw-dropping 1932 in the 200 to obliterate the previous world record there. Well, what about 1997? Not there either, but he still would take the gold at the World Championships. 1998 looked like a promising year given he ran 43-76, 43-96, and 4368, all back to back, but he just couldn't quite bring out that relay energy in the open four. Johnson was slowly running out of years as he entered his 30s, as most athletes in this event tend to peak arguably earlier, but he somehow had more in the tank. Even though his 1999 season looked relatively normal for him in both events, he would pull out the biggest wild card at the World Championships because his gap on the final straightaway was so massive that it simply had to be a record at this point. That was what I wanted to do. Things don't always go according to plan, but uh, you know I wanted to give it my best shot, and, and I feel like I did, and the result. All, all through that 400, it felt like what you knew it was going to be? Uh, I felt like, you know, the key was going to be hitting my first 200 in about 21, and I felt like when I got to 200, okay, you've done what you're supposed to do. You know how to go home, so it's to take it home from here. Well, we love you for six years of consistency, but congratulations on tonight. All right, thanks. At 31 years of age, Johnson's wheels still somehow ran faster than they had ever before, as he would finally tackle down Butch Reynolds' mark after countless attempts on August 26, 1999, running 43-18. Johnson was already considered the best sprinter in the world at this point, but this was the cherry on top to what would be one of the best careers ever seen in athletics, and he would occupy 14 out of the top 20 spots in the 400 single-handedly. The main question that rang in everyone's minds, however, was, is sub-43 possible now? Or rather, will we ever even see a once-in-a-lifetime athlete like Johnson ever again? After all, the record was at the point where it would take such an athlete to break it now. For a while, the answer was no. And like Reynolds' record, it stood the test of time one year after another. The 2000s came, and even the 2010s a bit. However, a kid from South Africa showed tremendous potential in his first couple years, but it goes without saying that not a single human could have seen the meteoric rise in his improvement that would be remembered by millions today. His name? Wade Von Niekerk. Hailing from Kreifontein, South Africa, Van Niekerk's sprinting origins became a sight to see when he became the fastest man in South Africa over 200 meters at just the age of 18. He wasn't someone who raced too often, especially internationally, but by 2012, he showcased a level of talent in the four, running 46-43. These couple 400s, however, appeared to garner a level of attachment from Van Niekerk, as he abandoned the 200 entirely in 2013 
too strictly raced the quarter, and had even qualified for the 2013 World Championships. Being knocked out of the heats, the prodigy would go home without a proper taste test of elite competition, but he stubbornly stuck with the 400, knowing that this was his true athletic identity. 2014 did show some substantial peaks in his career, placing second in the New York Grand Prix with a 44-38 and a silver medal at the Commonwealth Games, running 44-68, but he struggled to replicate the speed for the rest of the season. After a few local meet performances in 2015, no one really knew what Von Niekerk would bring to the table. But a win at the New York Grand Prix, followed by a sub-44 win in Paris, was probably not on Peoples' 400-meter bingo cards. With a free ticket to Beijing, Von Niekerk would make it to the finals where he had never been before. And with the chance to race against the best in the world all at once, this brought out a side of him that no one had ever witnessed. Hard on the outside, LeSean Merritt losing ground, but it's going to be Van Niekerk, South Africa with it, Le behind at the time, 43-47, well Merritt just behind there, and Karani James, he's shell-shocked, well I think he's got the lactic acid problem obviously in a big way, it's funny because he's taken off the track on a stretcher, athletes talk all the time about leaving it all on the track, yeah right, I think we can safely say that Wade did that, A 43-48, a half-second personal best, and best of all, a gold medal for South Africa. In just a single year, Van Niekerk had gone from a solid 400 runner that could maybe make the finals at a world championship race, to running one of the fastest times ever recorded and securing a gold medal along the way. This was an aptly timed moment in his career to gear up for Rio 2016, because with it only being one year away, he could very well hang on to this level of fitness and momentum. For his build-up to Rio, he played it much more conservatively than previous seasons. He raced a couple local 200s, a couple local 400s, and partook in a couple Diamond League races to scope out his competition. On paper, it seemed like he was primed to take another gold home, but many were concerned about something else. Something that only comes out once a year from Van Niekerk. And that's when you put him in the finals at the world stage. Something truly magical happens. Forty-three oh three is where the record stands today. Not only that, but he ran this time in lane 8 out of all things. A lane where, while perhaps physiologically easier, is mentally tougher since you can't gauge your competition until the final stretch. This was one of the most unorthodox records set in sprinting history, and the times that followed were just as absurd too. A 400 meter race this deep? truly may never occur again, but Van Niekerk may have a shot at breaking 43 in the coming years, given how young he is. At least, that's what people thought. But with high highs come low lows, and Van Niekerk's lows put him out of commission for about three years. In a celebrity rugby game, Van Niekerk would suffer an injury to his knee that, while innocuous at first guess, turned into a dual ACL and meniscus tear, something that would require surgery as soon as possible. He had attempted to return to competition in 2019, 
but his training put him back to square one, and it wouldn't be all the way until 2020 where he was back on the track. All things considered, his racing looked generally fine, and by the next year, he had qualified for the Tokyo Olympics. Sadly, he was knocked out of the semifinals, but at the World Championships, he would show some slight return to form, placing fifth at the 2022 World Championships. As it currently stands for Niekerk, his 2023 season does look to be the most promising we've seen in half a decade. But as we've seen before, he tends to shine the brightest when the whole world is watching. So many will be looking forward to his performance at the 2023 World Championships held in Budapest. The 400 meters and 440 yards record history was one of the quickest changing events in the record-breaking scene. It was as if an athlete wasn't allowed to dominate the event for more than a couple years, or in some cases, much less than that. However, the event became so incredibly optimized and happened to attract some of the best athletes to ever live that the record would stagnate for over a decade on multiple occasions. If anything, we may be in that era again where one lap fans may have to wait for their precious sub 43 to ever be achieved. But if there's a pattern we've seen thus far, it's that this record won't stand forever. And for the next person to break it, they'll likely be breaking the last legendary barrier in this brutal legendary event. This is the world record progression of the 400 meters, and thanks for watching. Thank you to all of my patrons for supporting the channel, and if you want to support the channel for more track and field content like this, come on over and become a patron, drop a sub, and check out my other links below. I'll see you on whatever video I upload next, and take care.